Record. Done. Awesome. That should be close enough. Um, well, cool. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, just um, while we're thinking about it, just a bit of a shout out to Aradia. Thanks so much for driving this project and stumping us. Um, all sorts of amazing topics, including this one, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, just want to have a shout out to Aradia. Yeah. Get started. I mean, Aradia, we've been talking about Stumpinars for a long time on Discord, and uh, people would just sort of do them. Like, someone would just hop into the stump and talk about a topic of interest, and it was very ad hoc and just kind of immediate, whoever was on. And then people were like, well, I would have loved to have been on that, uh, but I didn't know about it. And often they were held you know, in the middle of the day uh, on American time, which meant our old blood and our future folk couldn't really participate at all. And so, yeah. Yeah, Radia really took the reins and scheduled these, and she said she's scheduled out all the way to summer. Um, so there is a yeah. lot of knowledge on this Discord and a lot of people eager to learn, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of diversity in experiences and knowledge and all sorts of stuff like that, so love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. All right. Cool. All right. So yeah. Choose our topic. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. You go ahead. Okay, so uh, I'm Tellier, and I'm Bambi, I, and there's Bambi, <laughs> and we're here to talk about climate change, uh, which is a huge topic. So uh, we're specifically going to talk about uh, why climate change is a difficult problem to solve, particularly for governments, and then uh, what we can actually do to take personal responsibility in order to actually try to solve it. Um, I, Bambi, does it make sense to just talk a little bit about our backgrounds? Yeah, um, I agree. Okay. So uh, I'm Tellier. Uh, most of you know me on uh, in the Watt Spoilers community on Discord as Mihail because I'm the chair of the planning committee for SpoilerCon, um, but that's not why I'm doing this uh, Stumpinar. Instead, I'm here in my capacity as Dr. Talir. I'm a political scientist, uh, and I have studied climate change politics for many years. Yeah, great. Um, I have a slightly different perspective on this. Um, not as academically accomplished, but I do have a background in, I've got um, an honors degree in psychology and a postgrad um, graduate certificate in sustainability. Um, and so I work for um, state government um, here in Western Australia, working on transport and um, sustainable behaviors. Hmm. I need to kind of a. I may need to interview Bambi. In why I'm here in a nutshell. <laughs> Australia. I said I may need to interview you. Australia was going to be one of my cases yeah. uh, for my dissertation way back when, um, but then, uh, as with most cases in academia, you're limited by what you have grant funding to do, and I uh, did not have grant funding to go sure. uh, spend a couple months in Australia, so I ended up dropping Australia from the from the dissertation. Um, I but. mean, we are far away, so there's that. <laughs> yeah, so if you're going to go, you better go for like a month or two. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to talk first about uh, why climate change is a thorny problem to solve, and then um, Bambi is going to, and Bambi, feel free to interject at any point. I may throw you questions, just uh, so you know, and then Bambi's going um, yeah, sure. to talk about what you can do. Um, okay, so what we're not going to talk about... We are not going to talk about what climate change is. <laughs> we are not yeah, going to yeah, talk. Cool. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to try to convince you that climate change is a problem. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, it's pretty universally. There's a pretty universal scientific consensus that climate change is a problem. That's really not debatable. And in fact, when you have poll questions that go out asking people if they believe it, that almost does damage in that people think there's an option of no, I don't believe it. It's real. It's getting worse. Um, yeah. And right, while we, yeah, we can't attribute any specific weather event to climate change, certainly the recent wildfire experience in Australia has shown the devastating effects of having overly dry um, uh, uh, weather, uh, which has become consistently uh, more of an issue as climate change is getting worse. Um, so we're not going to 
Uh, yes, the fires of heaven, indeed. Um, we're, we're not going to really get into uh, the, the causes of climate change, what it is, um, you know, whether or not it's real. We're just starting with an assumption that all of you have a basic understanding about uh, climate change being a, a result of um, man-made warming of the atmosphere through the release of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases um, through right, our own human right. behavior, right? We're starting with that as a premise. Yeah. If, yeah. Uh, you know, we'll have plenty of time for questions, you know, if, if you guys want to ask about that, feel free, please feel free um, during the Q&A. Uh, it's not that we're not willing to talk about it. It's just we're going to start with that as a premise. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, it does go to some of the stuff I want to talk about a little later okay. around things that you can do um, are kind of based on the same assumptions of like transport and cars um, having a high impact and stuff like that. But yeah, I agree that. Well, right. But that's like, that's where the premise um, comes it's basic, in. It's basic right? assumption. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Because if, if, if climate change mm. is not caused by human action, then what are you going to do? Right. If it's either, mm. if you either don't believe in it, um, then you don't think it's a problem where you need to change anything. Or if you think it's due to natural causes, then, well, I mean, what are you supposed to do? Fight against Mother Nature? Um, so a lot of what we're going to say is premised on the idea that this is caused by us, by humans, and that uh, mm -hmm. not only can we do things, that in many ways there's a moral imperative that we do. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Cool. All right, so. And I'm going to, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Bambi. Just interrupt me. <laughs> oh no no no! I was just gonna I was just gonna say I'm trying to find there's I'll, I'll drop it in while you're talking mm. just in the Discord. There's a cartoon that completely sums up this. It's like a one-panel cartoon that completely sums up this attitude okay. around like helping the environment and like what if it's a hoax? Like, oh, I love that one. I have that one. I know exactly like what you're talking making about. Making yeah 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 yeah, yeah cool. So yeah. Um, the you climate just go summit, ahead and I'll um, I'll find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a, what one. if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I love political cartoons, and uh, if this were more than an oral presentation, um, I would uh, have dropped slides in for people to see. But since uh, we're just kind of doing it audio only, um, I decided not to give you guys slides and, and um, subject you to all my political cartoons and graphs and everything. Um, if you want to see those, but I they will send them later. But there will be a test. Uh, well, I mean, of course. This will be on the exam. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a whole category <laughs> at Trivia at SpoilerCon on Stumpinars, so uh, everyone start taking notes. All right. <laughs> Let's go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Aradia. <laughs> I should have told Aradia about that since she's in charge of Trivia with Kelsey. Um, all right. So we're going to start out. I'm going to talk about several of the, the challenges, the reasons why climate change is a really difficult problem to solve. Um, and we want to frame it this way because we've known about climate change uh, so the, formally from scientists since the mid-1980s, certainly um, before that in terms of some of the evidence. But it first kind of burst onto public consciousness in the 1980s. Uh, so that's 30, 35 years ago. Um, we've been wrestling with this problem. And it's not that governments have done nothing. Many individual governments have done quite a lot in order to cut their emissions, uh, move to a more zero carbon life. Uh, there have been agreements at the international level in the form of the uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, which was in 1992, the Kyoto Protocol to the Framework Convention in 1997, the more recent Paris Agreement in 2015. So it's not that at the national and international level that governments have done nothing. And even in the United States, which with states, which doesn't have exactly the best record on climate change, there's been quite a bit of action at the state and local level, right? So it's not that there's been no action, but we're still seeing temperatures continuing to rise. Uh, every Almost every year, we're setting a new record for hottest year on the planet. Uh, we're starting to see more events of intense hurricanes and cyclones, uh, wildfires um, are becoming obviously commonplace, although, I, you know, the one in um, this, the ones in Australia, of course, were 
uh, certainly well beyond uh, what has been the norm. Unprecedented. Yeah, unprecedented. Yeah, just completely unprecedented. Yeah. 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 I mean, is this still common in the news, Bambi? Is everyone still talking about it? Because it's sort of fall. It was. It was interesting when they first started. There was very little coverage in the American news on the wildfires, and then you had a bunch of reports being like, "Why are we not paying attention to this?" And then it dominated the news for a couple of weeks, uh, and now it has totally fallen off. Yeah, I think our local news, well, <laughs> I say local news here in WA, we have one newspaper, <laughs> one company that does the news in WA, but I feel like the media landscape is a whole a whole other conversation. Yeah. Um, it, it, kind of, it kind of has. Like, it has and it hasn't. I mean, it was sort of a big deal between end of August, early September, and obviously January. So mm -hmm. comes and goes. But um, it's definitely still part of the national conversation. Um, right. And it's interesting what you say about um, targets and action at a national level. Like, you can even get into the way that governments actually measure carbon and mm -hmm. how, like, I know the Australian government has been doing some tricky things with carbon accounting. Um, just, it's fantastic what you can do for your um, national KPIs when you just change the goalposts. You know, yeah. suddenly oh. including things. A hundred percent. Yes. Ac accounting <laughs> that like were always going to happen. Like you can do a whole lot of reading if you want to. We probably don't have time to get into now about like Australia's contribution to the Kyoto Protocol and what our actual agreement was. Long story short, spoiler alert, I think fundamentally we agree to increase our carbon emissions. Yeah. So that, that is true. Anyway, <laughs> back to you. No, 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 but this is really, I mean, the point about baselining <laughs> and uh, carbon accounting measures is really important. Um, and uh, Ogier is not on the Sumpinar, but he's uh, got experience in carbon accounting. And so uh, at some point he may want to chime in uh, later. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's online. He's just on my account. Uh, so... But what I will say about that, about the baselining, is 100% uh, governments do that, right? Because the goal is any the goal of any political actor, no matter what level of government they're in, um, they have one universal fundamental goal beyond any policy interest that they have, and that goal is to get reelected. And that's a fundamental oh, yeah. truth, right, about political actors, because it doesn't matter what your policy ideas are if you are not in office, uh, you don't get to vote and you don't get to uh, implement those policies. So your goal is always going to be get to getting reelected. Um, and, you know, as a result of that, you want to have metrics to point to that show that you're doing a good job. Uh, so often what happens oh, yeah. then, and, and you also want to get other actors and watchdogs off your back. So you want to be able to say, look, we're doing a great job. Uh, so that's why you often see benchmarks set really low so that it's what's easily achievable through low-hanging fruit um, or uh, changing b benchmarks, right? So in the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, the benchmark year, the year that they would measure their uh, greenhouse gas emissions against um, to use for any kind of reductions was 1990. So the yeah. agreement in the Kyoto Protocol was on average, they were going to try to reduce, they were committing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 5.2 percent below what they were in 1990 for those countries that are actually bound by the Kyoto Protocol. Um, but so that's using the 1990 rules. But the United States, uh, which uh, signed the Kyoto Protocol but never ratified it and later uh, withdrew from it, uh, you know, later on when they would start talking about what they wanted to achieve. They'd start using benchmarks like 2005. We're going to cut greenhouse gas emissions based on business as usual in 2005. Well, emissions were a lot higher in 2005. So even if they had yeah. agreed to a 5 or a 7% cut below emissions, if you change the rule to 2005 versus 1990, uh, that's a different story. Australia so, did the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, U.S. and Australia yeah. are, are Actually, two really interesting cases on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we both have the opportunity to do so much at a government level. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you're going to touch on that a little bit as well, but... Yeah. Anyway. It's a tragedy. No, it's that's the, the real tragedy. It? It's like this whole thing around, you know, we need to... This, this was a big thing in... And it still is. Um, we need to do our fair share for the region economic, in economic terms, in, like when it comes to mitigating climate change. 
at national policy levels, but that's always construed as, well, we're not going to lead because, yeah. you know, look at these other countries, look at other stuff, but Australia's a huge opportunity. Solar farming, yeah. and I know the US is the same, but the political context is different still with the state systems and everything like that. But Yeah, so anyway, maybe you're getting at my first, my first challenge, my first challenge mm. and the reason why it's difficult to solve climate change at the governmental level. Um, and this is the challenge of collective action and the free rider problem. Uh, so again, warning, I'm a professor of political science, right? So I'm going to be throwing concepts at you, but I will uh, kind of put them in context that we can all understand. So I want you all to think about the borderlands uh, in the third age. And, Excellent. Right? Yeah. And if you think about the borderlands, who is responsible for defending the Westlands from Trollocs and the Blight? And the immediate response may be, well, the borderlands, yeah. but is it? Right? Yes, they're the closest in proximity. They're the ones that have the most to lose if they get overrun. Um, whereas folks down in tier, right, uh, don't even necessarily believe that Trollocs exist because it's so far from them. It's just not, it's a removed threat. But when Trollocs are pouring through Tarwin's Gap, right? It's the people of Shinar that have to go defend it. And so you can think that, well, then Shinar has a special responsibility to solve the problem of Trollocs. But actually, it's the entire uh, world's responsibility, or certainly the continents, to defend it. Um, but certain certain countries, or in certain countries in the world of uh, the Wheel of Time, as well as in the real world, um, are, have greater responsibility simply because they have more assets, more ability to, to handle the problem. But collective right. action is a real issue here because of what's called the tragedy of the commons. And this is a, a idea that goes back um, to the 1950s and the article was published on it. And, and the tragedy of the commons is this idea that when there's a common resource that's shared by a community, it can be really difficult to govern that resource in such a way where the resource continues because every individual's right. incentive, right, is to like take as much of the resource as they can. Um, it's sort of like a, a pizza, right? You, you, you want to like hoard as much yeah. pizza so that you can get pizza and you're not so much thinking, most people aren't really thinking, oh, well, there's 10 other people that might need pizza, um, so I'm going to leave pizza for them. Yeah, and another example would be, with an environmental focus, would be management of, like, national parks, right? right. And, mm -hmm. I mean, this is actually where that term comes from. Um, tragedy of the commons was common green space in um, cities, wasn't it? And, like, everybody uh, use it, it's mm -hmm. your space, like, to, to play and everything, but then people have a tendency without strict governance to kind of trash it. And that, that was my understanding, at least, of mm. that or origin of that, it's um, actually, that concept, right? Yeah, so it's actually, um, it goes back further, so it's actually talking about 18th century governing of the commons uh, capital C in England, um, where you had this yeah, common yeah. space, not necessarily yeah. urban space, right, at the time, but common space on which you could graze your animals. And if you think about right, it that yeah, way, right? Okay, that's what I'm thinking of, yeah. Yeah, if you have yeah. a common space for grazing your animals, as an individual, you have the greatest incentive possible to put all the animals there because then that's all those animals are going to earn income for you, be food for you, provide resources mm. for you. Um, but if you're using up a lot of that land and all of your neighbors have the same incentive to use up a lot of the land, right? So, you know, if one per if your next door neighbor is like, oh, you know, seems like there's a lot of sheep out there, I think they're going to eat all that grass, is their response of, you know what? I'm not going to put any sheep out there. I want to save the grass. No, because then their next door neighbor is going to be like, hey, look, more grass. I'm going to put an extra sheep out there. So mm -hmm. everyone has the incentive to put all their sheep out on the commons. And then what happens? All the grass gets eaten, and then there's mm -hmm. no more yeah. resource for anyone yeah. to enjoy. Yeah. So yeah. there are solutions yeah. to the commons problem, right? This tragedy of the commons. Um, one of the solutions is to privatize the land, which is you know, what happened in, in England. Um, you take the yeah. land, you, the land is no longer held in common. Instead, you divide it up uh, and, you know, you give it to somebody who then is, you know, owns it and is responsible for it and makes decisions about who gets to use it. Um, so that's that's one of the solutions for dealing with it. Um, you know, you can then charge money or something like that. But the problem is, is you can't do that with the commons we're talking about, which is a climate that is not changing. Right, an atmospheric mm. problem. 
Yes, John, your, your sheep would get all the grass. We know that. Um, so it, with climate change, uh, you know, we're talking about an atmosphere uh, that is not riddled with too many greenhouse gases. We're talking about a climate that is not changing. That is held in common, right? If the United States uh, uh, and pollutes the atmosphere, and I said that as, as an if, but since the United States is polluting the atmosphere, right, the a effects of that affect every country around the world. Uh, we're basically eating up way more than our mm. fair share of grass, and we don't have yeah. a lot of incentives to not do that because you can't privatize the atmosphere. Well, I was about to say, <laughs> if, you, if you carry the same analogy through, it's like, I'm sure, I'm sure there'd be conversations, though. Can you imagine at certain levels of like, mm, what if we did? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I, I am yeah. joking. That sounds like a horrific dystopic future, but... Um, yeah. Yep. Well, so right. Carry so then on. you can try to get into putting a cost on the use, right? Which is where you get at ideas about carbon taxing, um, by basically yeah. putting a cost on carbon. Um, and and there have been efforts to do that that have had some mixed successes. Uh, but that's again, that's kind of hard to use because in order to put a cost on something, you have to be able to enforce payment of it. And inside a country, that's per relatively easy to do. If you try to steal a resource or use a resource and, and you don't pay for it, you go to jail. Yeah. But if a country does that... Thing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, I just... Mm. Um, interesting you talk about the carbon tax because, I mean, don't quiz me on the ins and outs of it, but we had that for about two or three years and it was just slammed mm -hmm. by the conservative media that we generally have in this country. And ultimately, government changed. It was, it was taken out of action. But apparently, if you go back and look at the data, it actually did work. Like, it was beginning mm -hmm. to work. It, it wasn't in for long enough that it actually had a meaningful, long-lasting impact on... Um, the businesses who were registered to it but yeah. i mean it looked like it was working which makes me really sad that um obviously it was stopped yeah and i mean I think, yeah a carbon yeah, tax anyway. is probably like the most effective uh governmental tool for affecting yeah. um change in this area but obviously it's politically thorny as any new tax or cost would be um to most mm -hmm. uh uh not to a lot of people right it's certainly in the u.s and australia uh, which don't tend to have as much social democracy as you find in much of europe um but uh you know, that what the nice thing is, or what a, a tax really does, is it, it changes your incentive structure around your own behavior. So if you put a tax on uh, gasoline, right, and you make that tax, uh, say, just let's say a flat uh, $10 a gallon. Now, in the United States, gas right now is about two sixty five American dollars. So suddenly gas jumps to twelve sixty five American dollars. Uh, you would not obviously roll that out all at once. There's a lot of issues with that, and certainly in the way that American cities are set up. But if your gas suddenly jumps to twelve sixty five a month, yeah, 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 and. It's, it's set it mm -hmm. up so that then there's public transportation options, right? The problem in the United States is there really aren't alternatives to driving a lot of time, and so that's actually just going to be eaten by people. But the goal is to change behavior. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and one of my big things in, in this whole conversation is actually giving people options and never just having one policy driver or one mm -hmm. um, set of infrastructure or what have you. Like, yeah. Because when you have a financial disincentive, while it can be really effective, I think, at a business kind of level... Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, businesses need to on-cost that, and you, know, you talk about expensive fuel and things, um, and it can have the unfortunate outcome of um, of hitting the people who can't afford it the most. And that sort of goes to the example of the people who are most vulnerable to climate change, um, most vulnerable to climate change impact, including these sorts of uh, disincentives. Yeah, totally. Being, um, the ones that are, that, that are hardest hit. You know, right. and so we, it's, it's a fairness conversation, I think, as well. Um, a hundred percent. So that, and that's one yeah. of the issues that I absolutely want to talk about is that yeah. um, different countries and people will be affected differently uh, by climate change. Um, 
so just to kind of finish on on this uh, point, right? So, you know, London introduced this congestion charge, and several other cities have done as well. Uh, yeah. Um, and that has le resulted in fewer cars. So basically, a congestion charge is when you um, charge people for driving into a city. So if you drive into central London, you have to pay a congestion charge um, per day. And so it has, uh, you know, part of it is to reduce driving for climate change purposes. Part of it is to reduce traffic. But the difference is, is that London has a massive public transport system. There are alternatives. Uh, in the, yeah. and, and for many European cities, they were built in an age before cars, whereas absolutely for yeah. our countries, that's not the case. <laughs> we were built a lot later, <laughs> and so and we and we're much bigger distances. So it's a lot harder to just slap a tax on uh, gasoline. Um, in that sense, uh, you know, carbon taxes don't have to just affect, uh, you know, gasoline, but just in that respect, it's, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult problem and with, uh, inequitable impacts. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so climate change, so that, again, in terms of solving this tragedy of the commons, um, you know, you have this problem of, well, privatization, okay, it's kind of hard to privatize the atmosphere, um, because if I pollute here, that pollution is going to carry across the world. Um, but also you have this issue of like, okay, well, maybe somebody can make you pay a cost then. The problem is, so in, in, in domestic politics, right, as I said, you can be thrown in jail if you refuse to pay. But in international politics, there is no international jail. Uh, there is no, you know, mm, if you're in mm -hmm, danger mm -hmm. here, you can call 911. But there is no international yeah. 911. The United Nations does not count. Uh, <laughs> the United Nations is no. not a world government. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also the Security Council, which is the only arm that has any, um, you know, ability to do really binding resolutions in any sense, binding to the extent that any international agreement can really be binding. Um, the United States has a veto. <laughs> so you have an actor oh, God, like the really? United States. Oh, yeah. The United States has a veto. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> in the Security Council. Because, well, you mm. have to understand that the United Nations was set up by the victors of World War II. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so they gave themselves my, uh, a veto. <laughs> um, who kind of also, sucks my um, year, year 12 history, like going back 11 yeah. years now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, but, Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's important. It's yeah. important context um, yes. for the current situation. I mean, the United mm. Kingdom has one too. Uh, so does the, So does Russia. <laughs> Uh, so does China, for that matter. So you know, you've right. got all these countries that have veto power, um, and they can just, uh, you know, they can, any legislation that would come out of the Security Council, which has, by the way, acknowledged that climate change is a security issue, uh, still, you can't just call the, you know, and any, the United Nations has very limited power, and it still doesn't have the power to throw a country in jail. You can have other countries bring pressure through uh, sanctions and boycotts, um, but you, again, yeah. you need to have a commitment to do that, right? And uh, not a lot of countries are going to want to threaten their economies by boycotting the United States and China uh, together. Um, although it's still, yeah. it'll be really interesting to see what's going on with the coronavirus now uh, in, in, with uh, travel often being restricted to China and how that impacts things. Um, okay, so the tragedy of the commons, this is just our first reason why. And you can see it's a really <laughs> difficult reason to get a lot of countries to work together on a problem um, where it's, it's, difficult, uh, it's difficult to have action. Um, the second reason why climate change is a difficult problem to solve is the problem of short-term costs and long-term benefits. So to solve climate change is going to require a lot of output of money right now. Um, money in the terms of building better public transportation, um, money in terms of switching economies from fossil fuel based to renewable energy based, um, in, in revamping the transportation sector. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of money. Uh, and the benefits are long term. Right. It's not like you pay money now yeah. and all of a sudden uh, the temperature drops. <laughs> right. That's not how it works. Yeah. These are long term yeah. effects. And that's not how governments tend to work. Governments like short term benefits for long term costs. Right. They like here's yeah. this great policy. Isn't it wonderful? Don't worry. You don't have to pay a thing for 10 or 15 years. That's what they like, yeah. because then they get all the benefits and they get reelected uh, and, and they don't have to pay the cost until much much later when it's somebody else's problem yeah and like that sort of links in nicely to something that i'll touch on later around like people just really don't like change 
like yeah. individuals. <laughs> yes. yes. We so can all kind of reflect yeah. on this in our own yeah. lives, in our own psyche, in our own way, but I feel like it's it scales right down quite yeah. nicely in terms of that. Because obviously, as individuals, we are the ones voting for these yeah. leaders in the first place. So Right. And yeah. on this particular problem of short-term costs and long-term benefits, it makes sense uh, for ourselves. Like, Let's say that I could tell you right now, I could hand you a new Wheel of Time short story. New, totally new. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, written by Robert Jordan, uh, just suddenly discovered in, in the files. But that's it. That's all you get. Or... Wow. I could tell you that uh, in 50 years, we will have the technology to use Jordan's notes to totally recreate the series he would have written about the Sean Chan. But you can't get Ooh. that for 50 Ooh. years. It's going to take 50 Ooh. years to get the technology. So you might not live that long, right? Right, right, okay? right, right, exactly. Which would you take? Mm. Now... We're all wheel I mean, time fans. No, but you can't get both, right? That's it. It's one, <laughs> one or the other. And so it would yeah. be really tempting to go for the short story right now rather than the more risky proposition of something that's you know way better in 50 years. And, and so this is part of the problem of you know, thinking about uh, time horizons and how we actually tend to discount the future. Um, and this is yeah. you know, in economics, right? There's this whole uh, aspect of economics about um, future discounting, right? It, which can actually measure just how much we discount the future. It's why you eat that piece of chocolate right now, even though you know it may yeah. have negative effects later, because you want you want mm -hmm. it now, and so you tend to discount the mm -hmm. future effects because you want it now, um, and, mm -hmm. and that leads to what's known as intergenerational uh, inequity, um, right? Which is that future generations are the ones that are going to be affected uh, the most Absolutely. by climate change. Yeah. Uh, we're yeah. not going to see the worst effects of it in in our lifetime, although we're seeing them much sooner than most people thought, uh, and so we tend to be like, well, I'm going to drive today. I'm going to continue my lifestyle choices because that's what makes sense for me now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And not thinking about the well, impact that those of, have on the future. Yeah. It's one of these things that um, I've been to a couple of the climate rallies um, and all the ones with the wonderful signs. Um, some of them can't be repeated here, but <laughs> um, calling out particular leaders and so on. But um I love this one. It highlights um, what was it? Um, we, we don't inherit the planet from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children, and that kind of goes to right. what you're saying. Um, but people just don't. It's not. It's not the default way that people think about any big issue, mm -hmm. um, let alone something as intangible as climate change. So, and, and part of that has to do yeah. with living in a in for some cultures in this world, very individualist focused cultures. There's other con cultures in the world that are more communitarian, more focused mm -hmm. uh, on uh, their community rather than just their own individual self and their own um, single family. Uh, and that's part of this, right? That when we're encouraged yeah. to be very individually minded, then we're not really thinking about the consequences of our actions for, for larger groups or future generations, um, yeah. which is a real shame. And to call out um, the comment just now from Super Skylake, that's exactly why this is also a conversation about equity. Yeah. Because you're right in saying some people just don't have the choice but to take that short, short term effect and drive to work to earn the money to feed the family. Like, of course, that's such a big part of this um, high level sort of policy debate. Right. And that, and that brings us to our next uh, reason, which is that climate change is going to affect different c countries and people differently. Um, so, mm -hmm. For this is the idea of concentrated costs and diffuse benefits. So certain groups and countries uh, have to pay costs in order to solve climate change, and and others uh, and others don't. But some groups are going to disproportionately suffer the effects of climate change, and others yep. can weather them much better. So you have a country like the United States, uh, or um, and, and I'm using the United States because we're responsible for you know a quarter of the world's uh, uh, carbon emissions. Yeah. Um, of just ourselves. You know, we have are a tremendous polluter um, of the world's atmosphere and a key driver of climate change. But the United States is wealthy enough as, as a general sense to be able to adapt to the effects of climate change. Whereas other countries in the world, like the Maldives, 
contribute zero emissions to the world, yeah. but will suffer yeah. all the consequences in the form of rising sea levels that will put their entire yeah. country underwater and need to relocate to Australia. Yeah. So to go to your earlier brilliant analogy, essentially the borderlands are the Pacific Islands, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, Except exactly. They don't have the ability to um, necessarily to make the changes at a global right. scale. Right. They don't have the resources, mm. right? Whereas those mm -hmm. that have the resources may not be contributing them. So you have this, pro this other, the other aspect of this that's interesting is that some countries may actually benefit from climate change. I mean, Siberia could become prime real estate if temperatures warm. Um, you yeah, know, we're Julia seeing, Point. you think about Antarctica, which just clocked temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit, positive degrees in Antarctica. Yeah. Which is the oh, highest temperature ever recorded there, and that yeah. was this last week. Which is, um, you know, we're seeing ice caps melting in Antarctica and in Greenland at astounding rates. So, what you're going to see then is like for, uh, you know, for those territories, those have suddenly become desirable land. Um, Canada, you know, parts of Canada yeah. are going to become much more inha much more habitable. Most of Can most Canadians live very close to the American border for um, weather reasons, but suddenly you have far reaches of Canadian territory that would suddenly become much more um, uh, profitable in terms of both having people live there and access to resources. Mm. Uh, so, so there are some countries as actually as, would benefit. Yeah, as long as you don't like polar bears. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I realize, uh, yeah, it, it's a cynical and interesting way of looking at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Ogier uh, pointed out mm. that the Maldives are essentially Malkir. Uh, Agree. Um, and then within countries, also, you're going to have disproportionate benefits uh, and costs for different people. So if you're a wealthy person or a well-off person, uh, you're going to be able to weather the uh, you're going to be able to adapt to climate change and weather the effects. Right. You sell you sell your beach house and move more inland. Uh, you have the ability to get your family um, out in the case of a wildfire or uh, a hurricane or some other kind of uh, disaster. But if you're not as well off, uh, if you're in a disadvantaged uh, population, um, or if you're an indigenous population where, uh, you know, attachment to the specific land uh, is, is, is really, really important, um, you don't necessarily mm. have the uh, ability to adapt. You're going to be disproportionately affected by climate change. You know, I think about Hurricane Katrina um, yeah. back, yeah, you exactly. know, many, many years ago now, and uh, many of the people who died in Hurricane Katrina when it hit New Orleans, uh, you know, some of them, a lot of them died because they didn't have ways of, of leaving. Not, you know, they, right. you know, it's not just a matter of like getting on a bus and leaving the city. If you think about it, right, uh, where are you going to stay? <laughs> if you don't have family you right. can stay with, uh, what are you going to do for work? Uh, you could lose your job if you leave. Yeah. And, and so when you're uncertain about the impacts, you, you tend to stay. And, and many people died as a result. And, and some of that just comes down to um, simply who has the ability to escape the effects and who doesn't. Yeah, let alone the insurance, right? And right. all of the, yeah. that, that side of it and the ability to bounce back. Right. Often sure people buy. As a yeah, result. people take territory. Yeah. Uh, you take apartments or buy houses in flood zones, uh, not because they're keen on the idea of their place being flooded, but because it's cheaper. It's affordable. You know, and affordable housing mm. is a real is a mm. real issue. But the point here is, is that the the countries that really could make a difference on climate change don't have as many incentives to do so because yeah. they are benefiting from the current um, fossil fuel industries. Um, yeah. Particularly, you know, in the United States, where those industries uh, contribute lots of money to political campaigns, uh, and yeah. they can withstand the effects a little bit better, yeah. or at least the wealthy people of their countries can. Uh, whereas poorer countries uh, and poorer um, people around the world, um, who the people who might be most affected, most vulnerable to climate change, really aren't in a position to be able to do much at a governmental level because their countries aren't contributing as much to the problem. Um, so that means yeah. you need a few key actors, uh, mostly the United States uh, and China and a few others, uh, to really take action. But those are the countries that precisely have the fewest incentives. I mean, in China's case, um, mm. you know, uh, it's sitting on, you know, it, it's been sitting on a huge reserve of coal. You're supposed to tell China, you know what, um, for the last uh, 
a couple hundred years, 170 years of the Industrial Revolution, we, the United States and countries in Europe and other parts of the developed world, we've been using all of our natural resources as we saw fit to make to help improve the quality of life of our, our people and become wealthy. Um, but you, yeah. China, you, 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 you don't get to do that because that's going to pollute the world, and we've already done that. Um, so you don't get to use your natural resources. You have to find yeah. another way. Like, that's a ridiculous thing to say to them. <laughs> they yeah, should all, you know... Right. Yeah. Like, it's not fair. And you could see why they're like, um, actually, we're going to use our coal to improve the life yeah. of our, um, you know, 1.3 billion people, which is way more mm. than the rest of you have. Mm. Uh, but so it's it also an sense. opportunity. And I think that, that things are changing. I mean, who knows really what's happening, but in places like China around using it as an opportunity for innovation around um, mm. different yeah. ways of approaching uh, renewable resources. And they've got some pretty um, ambitious targets around and that. And it's in, in some ways, they really are leading the world. But also, Australia should be among the top three in terms yeah. of taking responsibility at a government level. Um, we've still... There's a massive coal mine that is being has been approved and will be built in Queensland, not that far from the uh, Great Barrier Reef, which is an international amazing right. natural resource which is, is being bleached as a result yep. of climate change yeah um and yet this coal mine still got approval and it's happening and right. a lot of a lot of us here are really angry about that and that's just that's something that really easily could not have happened yeah. in a way of moving forward um and being a leader in the region and internationally so right yeah, and that's, that's again the top five as well that's that <laughs> problem of diffu- like yeah. reversing it of diffuse benefits and con- and um or diffuse costs and concentrated benefits, right? For that company, there's a lot of benefit to right. working on right. that, you know, getting that coal mine up and running. And while there's a lot yeah. of cost that's distributed so that, like, it's around all the country, everyone suffers. So no one's feeling that suffering enough as an individual to want to put their, like, put a ton of money into stopping it. Um, right. Because, the, you know, because the benefits will be attributed to all. It's like when one person orders like pizza and pays for it all right uh sometimes somebody can step up and do that and everyone else is perfectly happy to just eat their pizza and not necessarily contribute um Mm -hmm. so another uh set of challenges uh you mentioned earlier and i'm not gonna talk about it now because i think you're gonna get to it uh bambi but that's just that this is a lifestyle and infrastructure issue right that our infrastructure was built in an age before climate change and that creates that changes what you're able to do in countries that were built with an infrastructure for living very close together. Um, and that have, uh, you know, roads that are designed for walking, uh, then it's really, it's pretty easy to walk or cycle to work. I mean, if you've ever been to the Netherlands, uh, you don't see the huge parking lots that you would see or car parks that you would see in the United States. You see bike bicycle lots, everywhere yeah. everyone cycles but it's a it's a it's an easier thing to do in um, a smaller country that was built in an age where your main form of transportation was your own feet in the united yeah, states absolutely. and in australia yeah. right we're built on we were built in the age of the automobile they weren't thinking about climate change and so it's really hard mm-hmm. i mean there are where i live um there are some bike lanes but people drive everywhere and if you go out and cycle like it can be pretty dangerous people get hit you don't have protected bike lanes here and you don't have a strong incentive to build them because it's such a car culture Mm -hmm. and i live in a pretty walkable area and this is this you're describing my professional life (laughs) right (laughs) so i'll leave that to you yeah 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 um but yeah no it's 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 really important to make that connection between like the really high level stuff and and the um local policies local infrastructure stuff and then the individual um i think that Mm -hmm. um it's too easy to stratify them um without seeing the connections so that's why the conversation is really awesome and Ogier is pointing out in the chat that China has some innovative subnational initiatives that get slammed because they're implemented by an authoritarian government. And that's true that yeah. you, you do see governments trying to do things at the subnational or city level. But often, um, if your national government isn't supported, it can be really difficult to get funding for those initiatives. Um, and so there's been there's definitely been some yeah. successes, but also some failures for sure. Absolutely. Um, okay, so then the next uh, one is about um, economic and development issues, right? And, and I kind of touched on this earlier, but um, that for some 
uh, areas, you know, while, you know, the, there is going to be a huge outlay of money in order to solve these problems. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, the issue is, is that people tend to focus on that rather than the enormous economic benefits that could result from actually doing something, oh, right? Huge, so, right. Huge. So there's a focus on, oh, we'll lose these jobs in these coal mines, and it's like, yes, but if you build a huge solar industry, you'll be creating jobs, right? Green exactly. jobs. Uh, yeah, and, and, and yeah. can you imagine like subsidies to retrain? Right. You know, these people don't need to be left left on the right. um, like, like left by the wayside, so to speak. It's it's about a national strategy or some you know subnational regional strategies to bring these mm -hmm. people up to speed with the latest technology and training. Right. But, yeah. So and the costs of I say that I agree. <laughs> yeah, but also it's like the costs that could have been paid to minimize climate change. Um, think about now the costs that are going to be paid. Um, by Australia to deal with the after effects of the of the wildfires and and of course yeah. no money can replace the millions of animals no. that that died um, billions or the and the human lives Actually. that were lost oh sorry billions yeah. right billions of yeah. animals who yeah. died and and the human life that was lost as well like you can't just replace that like th those are those are priceless um, and and that that's just gone and that's because we weren't willing to put an outlay. Of, of money up front and so we're going to suffer way more costs on the back end than we than it would be if we put it on the front end but it's sometimes it's hard right you know telling people look if, if you give me uh five dollars now i will give you five hundred dollars in five years or ten years people are like ah you know that five dollars right now i mean i could go yeah you know, or, or, but then make it instead of five dollars. Imagine I say, look, if you give me your entire, you give me fifty percent of what you make this year, and I will, um, you know, multiply your salary by ten times in ten years. I mean, that sounds great, but can you really afford to pay fifty percent of your salary now? That's going to include made some real hardship. That's um, that's kind of basically the principle of a superannuation. You call it yeah. something different in the U.S., but yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, anyway, so there's the money problem. You know, have you ever heard of the Guiara Falls? I'm probably mispronouncing that in Brazil. I have not. They're actually widely considered to be, to be the like most beautiful mm. waterfall in the world. Um, but uh, if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry to tell you, you can never see it because in 1982 they were destroyed uh, to make way for a um, huge um, power plant in uh, Brazil. And uh, it's shared with Paraguay. And in order to make Aww. the reservoir, yeah, they were um, completely destroyed. And uh, that's probably why I never heard of it. Yeah, um, in, in 1982. So mm -hmm. you know, sometimes the path of development, uh, many times the path of development is put ahead of issues that are seen as purely environmental issues. And that's part of the, we're going to get into in a second, we'll talk about kind of the media approach to this issue and climate skepticism. But part of the problem here is that um, climate change is branded as an environmental issue for a long time. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. associated with, oh, the polar bears, the poor polar bears. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. so I, any presentation on climate change I do has an obligatory photo of a polar bear um, because that was the <laughs> traditional way to talk about climate change. But climate change is not purely an environmental issue. Of course, it's right. a huge aspect of it, right? Um, and it's, it's absolutely an environmental issue and an issue of animal rights, but it is also an issue of economic development. It is also an issue of human equity um, and quality yep. of life yep. and, uh, and natural disasters and health. Um, and, and, there's so, and security as well. There's so many aspects of this issue that, and that's part of the problem is that it, it's not easy to find a clear home for dealing with it. And it often falls as an environmental problem, which then make people dismiss it, its importance. Um, so thinking of it as a much more universal problem that affects every aspect of our life, um, you know, something that's, you know, important in, um, in, in my life has to do with um, the food that we eat. Every time that we make the decision to eat meat, right, we are yeah, yeah. promoting an industry that produces methane, which is a, uh, a greenhouse gas. Huge. Absolutely. Uh, so that's, in terms of concepts, I'm familiar with um, this as the sustainability triple bottom line. Is that the same as what you're referring to? Uh, go, you go economic. ahead and you, go ahead and talk about it. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, just it was just to say, like, um, you brought me right, right back to some of my sustainability lectures um, a couple of years ago, and um, it's like a three-circle Venn diagram, economic, environmental, social, mm-hmm. referred to as the sustainability triple bottom line, um, and that's where really... Um, the best sustainable development projects or initiatives or policies or whatever sit is in the intersection of all of those things. Um, and you're talking about an enhanced quality of life. Um, just to yeah. kind of throw that concept into the mix. Um, people can kind of, if they want more detail on it, that's something, something that people can look into a little bit later. But right. um, yeah, absolutely. And it'll, it'll get a little bit too... I was going to um, finish with a couple when we're in, in this session, Stumpin' Up this morning... Um, with a couple of those things, like just to summarize stuff that you can do. But yeah, eating yeah. meat and um, the um, the carbon miles of your of your plate of food, your um, the food miles, as right. referred to, right. is is significant. It's one of the biggest things you can do to have an individual impact. And um, if anyone yeah. you know f- felt a little uncomfortable when I said that every time you eat meat, you're contributing to climate change, um, or you know, I could also say every time you fly in an airplane, right? Exactly. There's a lot of actions that we take that are contributing to climate change, and that doesn't mean that you have to stop eating meat immediately or you're a bad person. Um, I still eat meat occasionally, um, but I eat a lot less meat than I used to. Um, and it's something to be conscious of. Uh, and I know you're going to get more into that, Bambi. A super skylight mm. brings up the bystander effect is a big part of it, um, especially for common Huge. people voting. Absolutely. So that's what I was getting into a bit about the free rider problem, right? Which is that it's really easy to kind of just uh, stand aside and be like, um, I'm going to just reap in. Uh, I'm going to let someone else handle it, right? Yeah, I'm gonna, it's like, it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's like the um, social loafing effect on a global scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, um, that whole thing where you're in a group project with three people and typically there'll be, like, one person, if you're unlucky, maybe two other people who are just like, oh, you look, you sound like you know what you're talking about. You just... Yeah. So um, Ogier is asking like, sh- if there are any examples of, of governments that have formed mm-hmm. cross-party platforms to deal with climate change issues because they're so fundamental and require uh, long-term investment. Um, we're not really going to... I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about uh, what governments have done, successes and failures, because um, I just really want to focus on the challenges of why it's hard. Um, that doesn't... Mm-hmm. I'm not giving... I'm not giving countries a pass by saying it's hard. They should still mm-hmm. be dealing with it, but it's it kind of mm-hmm. helpful to know. Sometimes people just say, oh, it's because governments don't care, or governments are out of touch. It's... it That may be part of it, um, but I want us to just kind of understand the incentive structures of politicians, which are to focus on things that have short-term benefits and long-term mm-hmm. costs, um, and also just the, the many, many challenges there are with dealing with this very complex problem. So are there countries that have um, dealt with climate change? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, but in some cases, those countries are ones that, uh, for which it's not a political issue to be uh, wanting to act on climate change, right? So if you're a country that is largely doesn't have a, a huge fossil fuel industry um, or is not um, doesn't have a, a huge fossil fuel lobby uh, and you're feeling the potential effects of climate change, it's really easy to get a cross-party platform that wants to deal with climate change <coughs> because the costs of doing so are not really high. In Europe, you started to, you've seen this issue taken much more uh, seriously But in most countries in Europe, you have um, a higher tolerance for higher taxes, which means governments are able to do more um, without necessarily having to put uh, as much money into the military like the United States does with most of its tax dollars. You also have um, some interesting features of the Kyoto Protocol allowed for countries to be able to invest Instead of making changes at home, they could invest in um, developing world projects. And by doing that, essentially get credit for lowering emissions. So in some cases, you had countries that were fully behind that. They could go invest overseas, and then they weren't necessarily suffering any negative effects at home. So a lot of what we saw um, for countries that not certainly there are some countries that are leaders in this that have done um, much more substantial uh, changes in their economy, Germany being one of them. Um, but in a lot of in other cases, you saw countries essentially just picking low-hanging fruit of, uh, yeah. you know, and doing what's easy. And then not yep. wanting to, and and so this is like the real issue, right? Which is that, <coughs> excuse me, the Kyoto Protocol, as I said at the start of the talk, um, asked for an average reduction in emissions uh, of five point two percent. 
Uh, and the problem with that is that at the time, and this is in the 1997, at the time, scientists were saying a f that what the actual number that we needed to cut emissions by. So this is cutting emissions below 1990 levels. The agreement was 5.2% on average, with some countries being given higher or lower targets than that, and some countries like China and India and Brazil not being given targets at all um, as they were developing countries. Uh, Bambi, do you know what about approximately what number the scientists were saying we actually needed to cut emissions back in 1997? I don't know that number handy. I feel like it's higher than what the targets were. Oh, yeah. Like, significantly. It's 80%. 80%. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's what you yeah. actually needed to reduce by was 80% yeah. to avoid the yeah. worst effects of climate change. And instead, they agreed to 5.2%, and most exactly. countries still didn't do it. <laughs> is that... Right. It's infuriating, really. Um, but is that partially because now I know the IPCC in their reporting over the last... 10 years or, or more, the goals there are set by pre-industrial levels, mm -hmm. aren't they? It's not 1990 or 2005 or whatever. We're talking pre-industrial. That, that's the actual scientific baseline, as far as I understand it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I feel like that's part of this as well. So. Right, and so and then what you have is you have organizations like the IPCC and scientists and other scientists that are putting out research on climate change that are in a you know full agreement and in, if anything underestimated this the rapidity and, and severity of what uh, climate change uh, is likely to cause the most co you know most likely models, um, and yet mm. that that research is often just utterly dismissed by people. Um, which is really, that's the last kind of challenge that I want to talk about, which is climate mm. skepticism, which is rampant in yeah. uh, the United States, uh, as well as in Australia, as I understand it. Um, is that right, Bambi? Do you still have a lot of people yeah. that are saying it's not a thing? Well, to be honest, I think that it's um, disproportionately represented in that Probably most people, if you ask them, they would say they care about it and that they do. Um, I don't want to say believe in climate change because that makes it a question, but um, would be a, on the de denialist side compared to the um, understanding side. I feel like most people think it is an issue, but mm -hmm. it's the politicians that we put in power and the the, the the national conversation is skewed to the denialist and that, and that yeah as you sort of alluded to that comes into the media um, representation it comes into the personal beliefs of the people who make the decisions at that level and how that just really doesn't align with um, what I really do think is the the national barometer um, but it's when you have an election based on economic terms mm -hmm. and I think this goes to your point around um, climate change and climate action being rooted as fundamentally a climate uh, sorry as a environmental issue and um, siloing the kind of parts of the conversation and also the strategies to, to face it um, if they're sort of like yes climate change is a thing and we acknowledge it but what about economic stuff? Right. And that's, like, far and away what our elections are, are based on um, and everything else is secondary, which is fair enough. Obviously, it's important. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. So, yes right. and no. <laughs> well, and that gets short, to that, to that, that short-term yeah. benefits, yeah. long-term cost problem, yeah. right? Which is that yeah, people exactly. are a lot more focused on, will I have enough money to feed my family tomorrow than they do yeah, exactly. on, you know, climate in 10 years, right? It is understandable. And even when you have people reporting that it's an important problem, um, it often gets ranked at the bottom of the list of all the other problems, um, which yeah. makes it hard to, to, and it's so thorny that that's why people keep putting it off and putting it off. We also thought we kind of might have a little bit more time to deal with it and, it and it turns out that we really don't so i actually found a poll um of australians uh, it's about a year ago so i'd be really interested in, in seeing how this number changed uh after the after the wildfires but um this was a survey uh by ipsos that says 46 percent of australians agree climate change is entirely or mainly caused by human activity mm. uh which is the highest since asked in 2010 
33% say climate change is partly caused by human activity and partly caused by natural processes, and 11% entirely or mainly caused by natural processes. Um, yeah. And what's interesting is a uh, Pew Research poll done, when was this one done? Also about a year ago, around the same time, looked at whether or not countries see climate change as a major threat. About 60% of Australians said it was a major threat and 59% of Americans. Yeah. Um, this compares yeah. to uh, in Greece, where it's 90%. South Korea, 86%. France, 83%. Um, Brazil, yeah. 72%. Germany, 71%, right? So it's it's yeah. much lower. Yeah. Um, the most recent uh, Gallup poll on this about a year ago, a little less than a year ago, in the U.S., it shows uh, that Americans uh, that believe global warming is caused by human activities is now at about 66%, which is a nine-point jump from where it was um, about uh, f 15 to five years ago. Yeah, um, I'd but love to see those yeah. polls redone now. Yes. the Ipsos poll. Right. Can you imagine? Well, but the like, thing is, is that takes, often anyway. it spikes, but then it's short-lived, right? So, yeah, I'm sure it right is, after the wildfires, is. people are going to really care yeah. about it, but then... Yeah. Yeah. It's a sustained action and yeah. systemic um, processes that will influence people's yeah. behavior. So. Right. And yeah. so... I said 66% believe that global warming is caused by human activities. Uh, here's another number, though. 66% of Americans say that most scientists believe global warming is occurring. So that means 65%. So that means that 35% don't believe that or question it, uh, which is, I mean, it's fundamental that no matter how you do the methodology, that um, the, the number comes out about 97%. If you look at either surveying climate scientists that work on this area, or if you look at the number of studies that have been published, it's 97%. And there was just a recent uh, study that came out that looked at that other 3%, the 3% that question whether climate change is real. And there's methodological problems in almost all of them. Yeah, many you know many of them are are funded by uh, grants coming from uh, organizations that are climate skeptics or have a uh, actual interest in, in in preventing action on climate change, and others were riddled with methodological problems. This is a true scientific consensus, um, and yeah. what I always would say to students, right, is like if ninety seven percent doesn't sound like enough for you, you're like, oh, it's still skepticism. Like, imagine if you saw a hundred doctors and ninety seven of them told you that you have cancer and three of them said you yeah we're not sure because that's what they say yeah. they're like we're not sure they don't say yeah. no they say we're not sure yeah. um yeah. are you going to take any action are you going to just be like oh yeah. well three said they're not sure so i think i'll just yeah. you know run with this one uh, um, i mean yeah you know? kind of for me to like a kind of a fundamental thing around um science communication yes. and like it isn't the role of science to be absolute it's the role of science to give you a working hypothesis and um and to defeat the null the null hypothesis of like is it is it like you, you know what i'm trying to say yeah like, it's not the role of science to be that definitive it's to yeah take the evidence to test it to be empirical but and so it's actually kind of incredible that 97 percent do agree <laughs> that's a huge proportion it's a huge um, scientific in, in consensus in right. empirical and scientific consensus terms so and part of the reason yeah, that people um, don't... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this is not going from that, your amazing numbers and research and all the kind of stuff to kind of a basic um, concept around it's really difficult to um, reason someone out of an idea that they didn't reason themselves into. Yeah. You know, like some people just... Are, no, no matter how much evidence... And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different um, motivational factors for individuals, but... Um, yeah, at the same time, those proportions of people who are that, um, at least in, in these countries that we're talking about, um, who are the climate denialist faction, um, and so on, it is quite a small number. And I was reading an article the other day, I think it's one that I sent to you, um, around different ways of categorising, um people's current attitudes and values and behaviours towards climate change action. And basically it was like a stages of change model, mm -hmm. um, but kind of said like, we can essentially 
get we could get caught up in getting frustrated by the people who will just ignore the science but maybe we're at a point where we can just accept that perspective and like leave them be and rather concentrate efforts on the people who are kind of in the middle because it's a bell curve anyway like you've got most people sit in the middle and around um maybe not having enough information because if they are open to information or um a whole myriad of reasons but they're open to it and so it's yeah. probably better to be um concentrating on those people and and the people who are um how was it described like aware but not mm -hmm. alarmed and right. moving them into action you know right. and so, i tend to agree yeah. with that because and it probably comes from you know working in the public service you get burned out really quickly if you're like concentrating all your efforts on people who just aren't interested you know yeah. there's a point at which you need to be like well you know it's frustrating that you don't agree and you don't see the clear evidence but i'm going to talk to these people who will actually listen to me so um it's part of it as well and the new cycle yeah yeah that's, so um, yeah so there's um, like three points i want to make on this yeah go ahead so point number one, I dropped this in the chat, um, but if you're just listening afterwards, if you go to PhD Comics, or if you just Google the science news cycle, PhD comic, um, oh, this, PhD this graphic comics. will come up. I know. And so this is fantastic. So one of the issues here is that um, scientists are not trained to talk to a public audience about their work very well. Some are pretty good at it, but but we don't really have strong incentives to do that for the most part, uh, because our um, our benefits in our career come from talking to other scientists, right? That's where you get credit. You know, if you're an academic, you don't get credit uh, for to towards tenure for publishing an op-ed that explains your your research really clearly. You get credit for publishing that in a scientific journal where you have to use scientific jargon. Um, and so this this PhD comic that I put in kind of illustrates this that when you um, when you have a finding that's worth communicating, it says, you know, you start here. Your research it concludes that some factor A is correlated with some factor B um, at this probability, uh, given C, assuming D, and under E conditions. And in the science news cycle, by the time it makes its way through the university press office and the newswire, the internet, local news, um, you know, it turns into... Uh, scientists find potential link between A and B to A causes B to uh, A causes B all the time to what you don't know about A can kill you to your grandmother wearing a tinfoil hat to ward off A right <laughs> like it's just it's really it can be really difficult to communicate all the nuances and uncertainty that are a natural part of scientific research and then people tend to just dismiss it if, if you express any uncertainty um, absolutely right yeah. and then the second uh you know, the, then the second issue here is, as you've brought up, is the media, right? Which is that the media tends, has for a long time, tends to pitch climate change as a debate, right? That we're still debating whether or not it's a, a real thing. Uh, and and yeah. John Oliver has this amazing uh, clip um, from last week tonight where he talks about this and he talks about the way that the media represents climate change, that anytime you have a climate change debate, you have... Uh, usually two people, one of whom is a skeptic and one of whom is a climate scientist and that it's usually Bill Nye science guy. I see that, uh, I think, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, and so he's like, well, I'm yeah. going to hold a, uh, a proportional debate on climate change. So he brings in three climate skeptics and then 97 climate scientists, <laughs> <laughs> right, who are all, like, shouting yeah. over each other. But just to illustrate yeah. that if you actually, you know, treated this issue the way it's treated in the scientific community, you would not be giving equal time to both perspectives. Yeah. You would, you know... Mm -hmm. And so all that tells people is, well, this is still debated, so I don't need to worry about it right now. Um, and I think people yeah. are going to be upset when they realize that actually, no, it's a pretty, you know, and maybe that's on the responsibility yeah. of people to, to follow this better, but they don't necessarily realize it's a consensus. No, but I mean, it goes to all of the systemic issues that we were talking about earlier as well. Like it's, it's at every level is kind of the way I think about it. Um, yeah. Media, um, media has a really big responsibility in this, but then obviously, like, what's the relationship between the media and the political yeah. um, political level? So, mm. so one other point I want to make on this uh, is 
in the United States, uh, I haven't looked at the research in Australia, but I'm just cursory looking. I think this is probably the case there, but I, I hesitate to say so because I haven't seen any of the research there. But certainly in the United States, what's really interesting is the way that beliefs on climate change has become an incredibly partisan issue. That generally, if you are on the uh, left side of the political spectrum, the progressive side, um, uh, supporter of the Democratic Party in the United States, um, which are all generally on the same side of the political spectrum, then you tend to be um, much more uh, accepting of climate science and, and, interest, and also interested in action. And if you're on the right side of the political spectrum— um, or uh, on the Republican Party, then you tend to be much less the case. And what's been really interesting about this is that uh, there was a study done about, well, how much, if you're, if you're really knowledgeable about science itself, does this affect how likely you are to believe in climate change? And what they found was that for those on the left side of the political spectrum in the U.S., the better your science knowledge, the more likely you were to um, uh, understand or to, to think that climate change is a, is a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is no difference on the right side. No matter how much science knowledge you have, it does not yeah, right. uh, affect. And so what's, what, the, what this becomes then is that this becomes a partisan issue, right? It's almost like you believe what mm. your team believes. And if you confront people with new information, um, our response to new information is not, wow, that's interesting. I'm going to change my perspective now. Our response yeah. to new information that comes in that contradicts an already held view is usually yeah. to discredit the source <laughs> um, or find yeah. the loopholes. Right. Yeah. So that our thinking, right. we want our thinking to stay consistent. We don't like being told that we're wrong. So instead, we try yeah. to come up with a way to still be right. And because that's yeah. how politics tends to work, and it's so uh, hyperpartisan now, uh, yeah. it becomes really difficult to inc to convince people on the other side of the political spectrum to take this issue seriously. Um, I want to say it basically it is like that in Australia, but maybe not so not so obviously. And it makes me think, and I don't have the numbers myself either, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. But. Um, it makes me think of comments that were made in the coverage of the bushfires mm -hmm. and um, people talking, like, obviously linking it to the global climate conversation um, and the rural fire service in New South Wales in particular were, like, the, probably the, the biggest face of all of this. And you're talking about rural communities, typically conservative in terms of voting... And all this kind of stuff and you had um i think one in particular a f like a fiery being like even me a firefighter in rural new south wales is hyper aware now of the climate crisis and um putting like crossing mm -hmm. that partisan divide so i don't know if that'll be a long-term effect but um that the fact that that was a point to talk to in the media, even right, it, I don't know that it was a, like at a large scale, but um, it was that stuck with me. That comment around like even me, you know, yeah. it's not just a because it is. It's so often seen as like an inner city hippie green um, kind of issue, and like oh, it's just those vegan hippies who don't really know what real life looks like, making a big fuss about something they don't understand. You're like, compared to now, um, you know, rural communities, because they've been confronted with in such an unprecedented way. Um, yeah. So, you know, it might be changing, but I do, th I do think it is, in, in, in a nutshell, in a word, still right. part of an issue here as well. And yeah. so Super Skylake asked if, um, you know, is it, is it me or will people fight harder to maintain the status quo than just about anything? And yeah. the general rule is if the status quo is working for you, then, yeah, you're going to defend it. Um, but if it's that's not, you know, yeah. that's where, you know, people take action is when the status quo, uh, in any issue is, is not working for them or for people or communities that they care about. Uh, and, and so the question then is, and it, Bambi, you brought this up earlier and I, this is where I want to end, um, my piece uh, of it. And, and you can tell that I'm a professor and that I've gone way too long talking about <laughs> an issue that I, I, I like. It's, it's amazing. It's great stuff, honestly. Yeah, uh, and I thought we like kept it the topic narrow enough that we wouldn't be going uh, an hour and twenty minutes uh, at this point. But what are you going to do? Um, but the last point I want to make is is what you made before, Bambi, 
Abby, which is that uh, too often our focus is on trying to convince the people that don't believe or don't care that they should believe or they should care. Uh, and, and what I would say is, uh, no, that's actually not what our focus should be. Enough people care. Enough yeah, people yeah. care and believe, and the, and the question becomes about activating those people in the ways that are going to be most effective to evoke change. And, you know, I've talked about some of the reasons why it's difficult for governments to do that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be pressuring them to continue to do that. We sh absolutely should, because governmental action is going to have far-reaching changes. But that also doesn't yeah. mean that we're absolved of responsibility for acting in our own personal lives while we, uh, while we do that. So... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I want to turn it over to you to talk about some of the ways now in which we can we can do that. Yeah, that's a that's a great handoff. Um, and I was just looking up that article around the number of people who, the proportions of people on that sliding sort of scale of um, alarmed in terms of climate change or global warming actually uh, to dismissive, and this was a. A survey done in the US in November last year, 2019, um, in the Center for Climate Change Communication. Mm -hmm. And we have 10% dismissive, 10% doubtful, 7% disengaged, 16% cautious, 26% concerned, and 31% alarmed. So mm -hmm. you can see it's kind of like, that's not even a bell curve. Like, that's just like. Right. But that's a majority concerned like, or alarmed. Rising up. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. And then this 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 article was in um, an Australian news source, and so it, it kind of goes on to translate it to to us. And I do think it fits, um, but that kind of goes to yeah this this idea of behaviour change, which I'll get into shortly after a, a short kind of introduction um, around how how to have these conversations with people. So to take a bit of a step back. Um, uh, I mentioned it at the very top of this, but um, so I work in what we kind of clinically term like behaviour change, um, with a focus on travel and transportation behaviours. Um, I think we've talked a lot about why um, transport and other things are a significant issue in terms of um, climate change impacts. We won't really go into that, but um, the long and short of it is cars produce lots of CO2. The last five years, the World Health Organization and IPCC have noted emissions from transport are growing at a really high pace. We're scrambling to put a cap at the same time as scrambling to put a cap on two percent. Um, uh, sorry, not two percent, two degrees Celsius global warming mm -hmm. relative to our pre-industrial levels. Um, and yeah, so it's my job to design um, programs to help people travel in more sustainable ways, and um, I, I love it. Um, so what that means is more walking, more bike riding, scooting, skating, buses, electric cars to some extent. Um, what we have is a pretty policy driven focus like around um, making best use of public transport infrastructure and so on like that. But certainly for me it's a really tangible way that I can participate in reducing vehicle emissions and therefore mitigating climate change. So obviously I'm based in Australia in a city on the west coast called Perth. Um, so that's the context in which this is happening. Um, we have roughly 80% car use across all trip purposes. It's 84% in some areas. Um, so that's everything. We're talking going to the shops, dropping off kids, going to work, education, procreation, everything. And Perth is actually known for this. So um, we, I think in the 80s, had our like tagline for our city was um, the place for drivers. You know, we talked a little bit about this earlier, Talia, around like um, this was a typical example of a um, post um, industrial revolution um, automobile centric city. And we were really proud of it. I'm glad that's right. slowly changing. Um, and I couldn't find a graph, but like when I was at uni doing sustainability, um, there was a measure of a car dependency. Uh, I couldn't find it ahead of this, but. Um, Basically, um, this was up to 10 years ago, Perth was second only to Atlanta, I'm pretty sure. I think it was Atlanta, number one car dependency, car dependency in all cities in the world, developed wow. cities in the world. Perth, LA, wow. I want to say, and then there was like eight more US cities. And I was floored. I was like, oh my God, I know this, but also it's just kind of horrendous. So anyway, that's just to say that's the context. At the same time, 
with the programs that we deliver, we see um, great results in terms of reducing personal car use while we work directly with communities, which is key. So we're talking like generally 10% reduction across communities at a, um, at a system level. That's so, um, yeah, so you, it's, it's all just to say like it's, you can have systemic issues and, and challenges with infrastructure and national policy, but at a one-on-one -on -one level, um, you really can make a difference. So what I'm going to describe is kind of delivered at scale. So we work with like uh, lots of um, 10 to 18,000 people at a time, but it's a very one-on-one -on -one sort of rollout. Um, and I'm also hoping that for those of you listening, there's something you can take away to your own life, if it's a conversation, if it's an action, um, personally, and so on. So um, some of the underlying stuff to this is um, that travel in particular, I'm going to talk about travel because it's my kind of area, but um, it relates to other elements as well, other action areas as well, is that, um, so one of the things, habits, are more powerful than attitudes or intentions. People so often conflate um, having a positive attitude towards a particular um, change, say um, reducing car trips, for instance, or eating less meat as like, I agree with that, I have my attitude um, positively orientated towards that, so that will somehow magically um, result in changing behavior. And for some people it does. But we know that habits um, are really important with that and heuristics and schemas um, direct a surprising amount of behaviours um, and links into things like decision fatigue. We're not really built, the human brain isn't built to deliberate over each right. and every single decision and that comes right down to like picking up your car keys in the morning and so on. Um, therefore, the seemingly easiest option for, the, for what most of us have grown up as car dependent cities is to drive. Is like that's our default option and that's the um, point at which we um, set our assumptions when we begin working right. with communities. This and can absolutely be applied to like food. So go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, and I think that one of the keys here is that it can be really overwhelming to be like, oh, wait, I have to give up meat. I have to start walking everywhere, Hugely. biking everywhere. Right. But absolutely. it's not about like going from zero to a hundred percent. Right. It's about no. being aware of how the, the behaviors that are just kind of part of our natural habits and patterns are contributing to this problem and making making changes gradually making changes small changes right so i said earlier that um i still eat meat but at home i'm pretty much vegetarian uh yeah. and, that, and that's not yeah. just for climate change reasons but it makes me I, if you told me that I had to give up meat, could never eat it again, um, I would probably find ways to like you know reject that as a premise because like for right. me that's not something that I'm at least not right now feel comfortable doing. Now check with me in five years and maybe I'll be like you know what I don't really miss meat. This is an easy thing to do. Um, right. But for me being like you know what I'm going to dramatically reduce my consumption of meat and only have it occasionally as opposed to having it multiple times a day. That was actually very very easy. To do it, it helps that I, I live with an amazing cook, uh, but um, you know. Uh, but I think that that's an that's such an important point that you don't have to like go from zero to one hundred percent. It's about absolutely. recognizing how your behaviors contribute to these sort of problems and, and making uh, making changes intentionally um, and for the right reasons. Yeah, and I think it's really important to understand that like it's not about guilt it's not about shame or blame or anything like that particularly when it is really easy to be overwhelmed with the scale of the problem one of the um other sort of systematic um underlying elements to this approach is a concept called motivational interviewing um fundamentally it's about ne you never be pushy when it comes to um convincing someone or having a conversation with someone or whatever about changes that they can make um, because most other people won't be as passionate about it as you are like I really believe in this you know honey attracts more bees than vinegar rule like sure. make it fun make it easy make it small make it um, like manageable it's kind of like a goal setting thing as well around that and um, people are motivated by different things as well so um, you talk about um, the scientific evidence divide between certain groups of people like that 
it sort of boils it down to a very simple set of concepts, but you can talk about head, heart, hands. Like some people mm -hmm. are convinced by um, scientific um, data-driven arguments. Other people are really interested in what it is, what it means for them, for their families, um, in a much less tangible way. Um, it feels right to make a difference. Um, or there are other people who really um, learn best or um, experience um, will take on board changes much more when it is physically tangible. Like, um, I, I see the difference this is making. Um, that might be in terms of the overlapping benefits of health, well-being, um, and so on. Um, and so, yeah, it's about making it gradual and 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 about supporting people into that change as well yeah i think one of the most instructive conversations i had about climate change was back in about 2007 um and i was out in california talking to some policymakers. and california has done some really interesting um mm -hmm. uh, projects on on climate change and policy making and the nice thing about california doing that is it's such a huge economy by itself that it often pushes a national change you know if california changes its regulations uh on on, on car emissions then uh car companies have to choose whether they're mm -hmm. going to do two separate sets of cars, one to meet the California market and one to meet everybody else or just move to the California standards. Um, right. But I was talking with some uh, policymakers there and they said, you know, if we talk about specific policies and we talk about them in the context of um, green jobs or, uh, you know, uh, and e economic conditions or, or public health or any of those other effects, uh, they, they often are behind the policies. But as soon as you connect the policies to climate change, it's a, it's a non-starter. Like the words right. climate change, and, right, and right, this right. is you know more than ten years ago now, but that always really stuck with me, okay. in the sense that sometimes it really is about how we talk to people about these problems, um, and so you know when it comes to say something like uh, let's let's take the example of having children, right? Because uh, overpopulation of the world is also contributes to climate change, yeah. uh, you know. But for people that um, are thinking about having kids, that might not be a winning argument to not yeah. have children yourself, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But there may be other things that people haven't thought about that uh, might make them uh, less likely to have their own biological children, right? And let's mm -hmm. say that they choose they choose not to have children um, because uh, of the the cost of raising a child uh, and the realization that maybe there, there are other ways they want to spend their money, right? This is just an example. Yeah. Yeah. The point yeah, is, yeah. is that that decision to not contribute, to not have a child uh, is going to have those effects on lowering overpopulation, even if that's not the reason why people made the decision. If you course, choose to yeah, not, right? Exactly. So if you choose not to yeah, eat meat yeah, yeah. because it's too expensive or because of animal cruelty reasons, uh, that still results in less meat being eaten, even if it's not being done for climate change. And so sometimes we have yeah. to be a little pragmatic in how we approach these issues in say, you know, for some people, uh, you know, climate change is going to be the reason why they want to change their behavior. But for people who it isn't, like, we, the, the goal is to get the effect, right? Let uh, people yeah. find their own reasons for, for changing behavior and for achieving the effects. Exactly. And this kind of goes to my next set of sort of concepts around this um, at the very specific individual level. And I think you make a good point about like, so I'm talking about individual conversations, individual action and, and people, but obviously not like there's the general population, but policymakers are people too <laughs> and so it, it's it's in <laughs> I hesitate to say but like it's in those conversations and that's actually super important I think having that way of communicating at that level would be I mean it's it's a strategy approach isn't it it's about right. like well we know the outcome we want to get but like how do we communicate this and we always do that in government as, as well but so there's this idea of cognitive dissonance which I think right. kind of gets a bad rap um, it is central to our methodology um, mm -hmm. most of the time in that you're kind of like having a conversation with someone and say like, um, okay, so this is your current car use, um, what, what sort of, have you got bikes at the house, um, things like that. Um, and, you know, can you tell me about a time when you were driving in your car, for instance, and you had a really bad experience? Mm. You can start it like that. Or you can sort of say like, well, tell me what you value. 
you know, people often talk about time with kids. Some people will mention the environment. Um, productive time, um, it's often about time, or um, safety and stuff like that. And you can kind of twist that around and say, well, you know, um, you say you drive your kids to school every day. Some are not, like, some people have had a lot of benefit in this, people in your suburb even, who have um, tried once or twice a week walking their kids to school when they can. Have you thought about that? Or and right. and or even it's even better when it's unprompted. Often people will um, begin to talk about um, their own ways of um, things that they may have thought of over the years to to kind of solve that problem. Problem being, you know, road rage of other people or like wasted time sitting in traffic on the freeway. Right. Nobody likes right. that. Some people just seem to think of it as like a like a, a long suffering part of being a blue a, sorry a white collar worker, typically, um, but it doesn't need to be that way. Um, and you know, yeah. you, even in a city like Perth, where um, generally the transport infrastructure is pretty skewed to one mode right. of transport. So anyway, it's just that idea of taking what someone values and saying sort of flipping it and encouraging them with the right support to actually come up with their own solutions to ins- rather, rather than um, inserting their own evidence um, and or not taking on that um, right. perspective. And so in- instead of changing their attitudes, they change their behaviour to fit the attitude. It's, it's what I'm sort of so circling around. I think that's a really great so way that, in, yeah, of, a, yeah. of approaching it, right? Because then it's yeah. like, you know, the way yeah. I was talking about it is like, look, um, don't, don't eat meat because here's all the reasons not to eat me and instead yeah. instead frame it as uh, look at all the amazing vegetables that you're going right. to right. get to try right so it's exactly. it's making it a positive as opposed to it's exactly. and and a lot of the research on gain and loss show that people feel lost way more than they feel gain right so there's all these famous oh, yeah. uh, yeah. studies done by Kahneman yeah. and Tversky in uh, back in the yeah. 70s that show that like even you know even if the expected value of a loss and a gain are the same people will take action to avoid losing something they already have getting back to super sky lakes point about uh, the status quo and trying to maintain the status quo we, we yeah. want to prevent loss more than we're willing to spend to, to get gain and so, so yeah. i think that's a, a great way of putting it like instead of being like you don't get to eat meat anymore or you don't get to travel as much you frame it in more in more positive ways of the things that you do get the gains that you get as opposed to seeing it as a loss so i think that's a great Absolutely. way i mean to approach it yeah yeah and like examples that we use from a transport perspective are like you can watch netflix on the train Right. If you do that when you're driving, it's illegal. Don't do that. <laughs> like, it might take a little longer, but think about the benefits. I encourage people to think about the benefits of that instead. And so that's a really important one. And it cuts across every level and um, decision makers and everything. Um, the other stuff is probably more at a community level, but talk about influencing social norms and social diffusion of the new norm um, is something that we concentrate on as well. Is that that's that's around like um, getting talking to the right people and getting people out to trial these new behaviours hmm. at scale. Suddenly, people are having conversations with their neighbours about it, um, and we've got like things like branding and stuff like that. You know, backpacks and, and whatever, um, which in and of themselves don't change behaviour, but are a visible indication of a movement in the community, and that's really important. And obviously, things like social media messaging and but it's the same framing, as you say, and um, a normative messaging uh, around the benefits, um, not banging people over the head with the statistics about why it's bad. Nobody responds well right. to that. We know that. Um, right. Even I mean, though you still see pictures of um, horrible health effects on cigarette ads, um, we know sure. that that approach doesn't really work. Yeah. Right. So, so you're reminding me of, um, you're talking about like social connectiveness and communities. Um, there's a, a book written um, a couple decades ago now uh, by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone. Right. I don't know if you know. Um, and, and his idea was that it, he's talking about the loss of like the social fabric of American culture. Uh, and he was writing this in a, in a pre-internet age. 
um, mm -hmm, uh, right, yeah. uh, and, and talking about how uh, Americans used to join groups like bowling leagues. That's where the bowling alone comes from. Got it. Um, and bowling Got leagues it. were really common. And that the great thing about bowling leagues were that the people in your bowling league weren't necessarily like your closest friends, right? They were just people who had a common interest in bowling from the same community that, that would interact, right? But that in the course of bowling together, uh, you would talk about issues that are facing your community, just as like, you know, because you're just a people from the same area, you know, yeah. um, spending a concentrated time together uh, regularly. And th that could then generate into social action yeah. within your community. Uh, and yeah. that now that people are essentially bowling alone, are no longer bowling leagues are falling out of style. People don't join groups anymore for a variety of reasons that he points to in the book, that we've lost some of that social connectivity. And, and some people would say that, well, what about social media today? But the problem with social media, of course, is that it's not necessarily people from the same community as you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so while you can certainly feel connected to people on social media, I mean, certainly I feel very connected to many of the people on Discord, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's not necessarily going to translate into social media political action uh within a single community yeah and it's talk about social media like it's so um what's the term they use around um like bubbles you're in your social media oh, mm -hmm. echo right. chamber echo chamber that there's right. a whole concept in that that we could spend some time talking on if we um had the luxury <laughs> but um yeah i think it's so important and that's something that's definitely um, been disintegrating across Australia, the US, um, probably all over the world, and it's so easy to just not leave the house anymore for anything, um, you know, groceries, food, entertainment, anything. But um, I think it's why our approach um, with this sort of community-based um, behaviour change model is so powerful is because a, a core tenant of it is getting people to talk to one another and to connect to yeah. the local communities. And, um, you, you know, we do find that when there's younger families and um, people who are, new, who are newly parents, for instance, they're actually more interested potentially in looking outside of their household a little bit more for the interest of their kids in the community, in the school communities. That's something that bears mentioning. Like, that's a really important part of this whole approach as well is... Um, leveraging the um, connectedness that a, a local catchment public school has in, and the influence that they have on the parents. And um, it's not just because they're a captive audience, it's because the people involved at that level are usually very motivated in their own um, neighbourhoods and communities. And it's amazing what right. people can do when they get together. Yeah. And, like, it makes us happier. It's kind of a tangential conversation, <laughs> but um, I've been listening a lot to this other podcast called The Happiness Lab. Um, it's amazing. Um, if you guys aren't aware of it I recommend um, checking it out it's um by a, a uh, I want to say Yale University professor in psychology and it's all about all the little things that we can do to um, make us happier one of them is being social like it sounds really obvious when you say it like that but it's disintegrating as you say so right anyway to <laughs> to um <laughs> to, to, to bring it back around again um of course like well you know I'll oh, be talking a lot about the transport behaviours, transportation, like you say in the US. Um, the same principle can and has been applied to myriad pro-environmental and health behaviours around this behaviour change model that I've been talking about, uh, including reducing plastic use, quitting smoking, household energy consumption as well. Um, and there are a ton of other things that we've sort of touched on periodically through the conversation um, that individuals and communities can do to reduce the overall impact on global warming and climate change reduce meat and dairy as we have been mentioning a fair bit i'm also a vegetarian and that's the same i had a similar journey in that well um zarth a bit of is that i think zarth happened? just joined zarth can you mute yourself please all right muted um I think that wait, we, we can't wait hold on we can't continue right now um are you getting that buzzing noise oh i Bam. muted i muted him on my end is that yeah but one? uh hold on i i yeah oh all right it's did you change okay, something? yeah i don't have the ability to to mute for some reason um okay okay all right it's well, it's gone now so i think uh i don't know why but it's solved all right, oh. all right. thank well, you 
No, it's the okay. editor. Let's Continue. Let's yeah. Out. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Radia, um, you might want to cut that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So go to ahead. go back, maybe uh, like mm, ten seconds or so. Yeah. I was just to say, like, we've been talking a lot about the um, reducing meat and dairy because we know that that has a huge environment, environmental impact on um, methane emissions in particular. Just wanted to mention, like, I actually had quite a similar experience. I've been vegetarian for coming into 10 years, but when I started it, that was not my intention. <laughs> I was, I'm very much a in increments kind of person myself, and so I really appreciate that whole, um, you know, don't bombard people with um, expectations and shame and, oh, look at these impacts, because it's so easy to just shut down, and, and I definitely empathise with that approach myself. Um... Also, reducing single-use plastic. Like, where do we think the oil for creating plastic products comes from? You know, that's, that's actually quite a significant um, carbon footprint. Compost. Food waste. That's a whole conversation by itself. But composting and carbon capture is not just a matter of, like, diverting food that would, would, may otherwise end up in landfill and create methane emissions. It's about putting that into a circular economy and actually capturing carbon by improving soil. Um, we talked about fly less. Um, there's this like hashtag no fly 2020 thing. Obviously mm -hmm. that's not possible for a lot of people. Like people need to travel and same goes for car transportation. But, um, you know, cutting down um, air miles where you can is um, significant. Can, can yeah, I talk about yeah. that one for a second? Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. Please do, yeah. Cause, cause I, I, so my um, partner um, is made the decision that he does not want to uh, travel uh, very much um, because of the, the carbon emissions. And so he's decided yeah. um, that he is going to limit his flights to four a year. Um, and I am somebody who flies a lot uh, for work, but also to visit friends and family. Flying is just part of my natural experience. And, uh, you know, I'll, um, you know, donate to offset the, the carbon emissions that does not keep me from flying, right? So even though I know, yeah. you know, all the stuff we're talking about, right? Like, I still, flying is something that I'm not necessarily willing to give up as much, but my partner has. And that has been, um, you know, something that we've had to discuss because, like, for example, a couple weeks ago, I went and visited, um, I was in Michigan for work, and on the tail end of the work, I spent the weekend with uh, Christine from, from Discord which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And originally yeah. my partner was going to, was going to come, uh, with me for that trip, but he decided that, uh, he, uh, you know, if, if he's going to stay with this idea of four trips a year, that that was not going to fit in, you know, between spoiler con, Jordan con, uh, visiting family, right. That, that, that's it. Um, and you know, and, and yeah. And, and, uh, so, uh, he, Four is still a lot for many people, right? So many people don't fly at all. Uh, but there, you know, there's this idea of like, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be serious about this, like that's going to mean some personal sacrifices. And for him, that meant not getting to see friends uh, yeah. because of this. And and I 100% support you know, him in these principles, even though it means like, I'm going to be going, um, for work to Hawaii in March. And originally we were talking about him coming with me and, and now he's not, um, yeah. you know, and I, and I'm sad about that. Right. I would love to have him come, but this is a decision that he's made about how he wants to take personal responsibility for what he can, for how he contributes to climate change. And, and, you know, while I'm not willing to, to go that far, that's kind of a decision that I have made. Um, it, it's the kind of thing that's, you know, sometimes it really does involve, you know, real sacrifices, but it it is doable and what yeah. it ends up meaning is is that then the trips that you do take you're like you're being very intentional about those trips and and making the most of them i think that's a really good point actually being intentional it kind of underlies this whole conversation in, it, in a sense but um just just that as a first step um can be incredibly powerful because as soon as people start thinking about it, it kind of goes, I mean, I didn't really talk too much, in too much detail about it, but this concept of um, heuristics, like it's so easy for us to just act by default and to not really um, be deliberative about, deliberative about the decisions that we make, even you know, when it comes to all of these things that we could do to reduce our carbon input, but just being more intentional and, and deliberative is all is already having a can also have can already have big impact in and of itself um i think 
And so, um, cause then it, it, it leads to that gradual behavior change. Like, um, for not everybody can reduce their flying, like you say, and for you, you got to consider as well the benefits of flying and having this conversation and what you can do with your work to influence um, this stuff at another level um, and for other people in their work as well. And the benefits of seeing friends and family, like it's all so important and right. it's complex, like isn't it? Like that's, the, that's the crux of this whole thing is it's complex. Humans one thing and decisions are never straightforward, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the other things that's interesting about that is... Um, you know, this conference I'm going to in Hawaii is the International Studies Association's annual meeting. So it usually has about 6,000 people, um, and the ISA is drawn from people all over the world. Uh, a lot of Americans, but all over the world. And so, uh, you know, every 10 years or so, they have this conference out in Hawaii to make it easier for people coming from Asia uh, to get there. All, uh, you know, it usually means a lot of the Europeans don't come that year, but that's uh -huh. fine. Right? Um, and... The, the thing is about a lot of these uh, conferences is that the panels that you attend are actually not really necessarily the best way to share information about research because it's people giving, you know, 10 to 15 minute presentations about their research, uh, five of them in a row, then a discussant giving them feedback on their papers, and then there's sometimes time for Q&A. But the Q&A is where like that actual exchange uh, happens. Yeah. And uh, it would be probably just as easy to do that without anyone leaving their homes, right? People, you right. know, we, we use video conferencing systems to do it that way, and we have that exchange. But uh, there's a lot of resistance to do that. Now, think about 6,000 people flying to Hawaii and all of the emissions that that's going to cause. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this includes, by the way, panels on environmental politics and climate change, right? And those people do it too. Uh, and part, you know, part of the reasons we have to, that's the way our, our discipline is set up. But there could be a very intentional way of saying, you know what, um, we don't want to do that. Um, yeah. And we're going to invest instead in turn and putting as much of this online as possible. Now, they actually are yeah. doing some interesting things right now of having some people contribute audio presentations, but that's solely a one-time thing because of travel restrictions on coronavirus, right? So our, right, our right. scholars our scholars from China, for example, are not going to be able to come because uh, they're not allowed into the United States right now, um, mm. or, or, you yeah. know, there, or there, there's, uh, there's issues in terms of, of travel, um, and, and uh, there's also, uh, in, in Brazil, there are certain travel restrictions as well in order, uh, because of the virus. So it's just this kind of interesting thing of we're not thinking about things even like conferences from a perspective of being uh, truly uh, focused on climate change. Yeah, yeah. And, like, we were talking with um, a big global company, which should probably remain unnamed, who are doing um, some great work in this, and they've got some really um, ambitious targets for um, cutting their emissions. Exactly how they're going to measure that, I think it's a bit unclear, but anyway... Um, and that's, I think that they're positioning themselves as being leaders in this. And this kind of goes to the, um, question of ability and, um, taking responsibility where you can, and where you have mm -hmm. that, that, you know, large, um, Im impact. And it, we talk a lot about government, but like, um, businesses and other organizations do have the ability to kind of live in their values um, as much as an individual does. So um, right. it also makes me think that if that, yeah, you're having a conversation at this conference about this topic is kind of a good opportunity to leverage something like cognitive dissonance to be like, mm -hmm. hmm, hold on, so how do we all get here and um, what are we talking about? Let's just sit on that for like a minute. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it's uncomfortable, but as you say, like it's it's um, something that we need to. It activates it in your mind, uh, right? Things. It's yeah, that's, it's this that's moment of saying, right? right? Yeah. And and so this is yeah. done at some conferences now that I go to, um, where at the start of a presentation or the start of a session, um, people uh, will have a statement reminding us that we're on native land and and the land specifically who that land belongs to, yeah, um, and, and that we're we're on their land, and, and that activates that understanding for you know at least for that moment. Now, I mean that's a small thing and. And, you know, then, then things move on, right? But that constant reminder of being on native lands that was taken 
um, from the rightful owners, right? It, that can generate this sort of interest in learning more and uh, thinking and taking action, right? And so you yeah. could have that same kind of thing of like at the start of a, a panel presentation being like, I traveled X miles to be here and emitted this much carbon. Um, and then it's sort of like, well, we better get a lot out of it then. You know, if we're going to be on native land and and yeah. emitting carbon emissions yeah. and in other, you know, being conscious of those behaviors, it's like, well, yeah. then then let's make sure that this is worth that. And if it's not, then let's question why we're doing it. Right, right, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so it's a very relevant sort of tangent, I suppose, to to go on, um, but to kind of bring it back, I guess, um, to this short list that could really be a very long list of, of other things that we can do is, um, so we talked a lot about flying and the ins and outs of that. Um, some of the big scale ones are um, been part of conversations for a very long time, but still have made um, not a huge amount of progress around switching to renewable energy at a local scale. Um, a lot of the households around where we live now have solar panels, um, converter technology and so on battery packs still have a long way to come but um, I think that's obviously another really important way that people can reduce their impact um, and also something that's really interesting to me that I'm still learning about is um, the carbon footprint of clothing oh uh, yeah that's a whole thing that um, that is quite nuanced in itself when you think about the supply chain um Something that I'm quite conscious of myself right now is natural fibres compared to synthetic because it kind mm. of circles around to the question about reducing single-use plastic. <laughs> um, right. Nylon and polyester clothes are often um, based on the same oil um, as not the same, not necessarily the same oil, the same processes. Obviously, there's chemical differences, but fundamentally the same kind of thing as plastic. But that's, so there's right. that. Yeah. But that's a great example. And landfill, and landfill of, of throwing out like that whole yeah. question of fast fashion and mm -hmm. cyclical um, um, fashion cycles, cyclical fashion cycles. Oh, I'm so right. articulate tonight. <laughs> but, um, so going to landfill that, and, and causing that to go ahead. No, sorry. I, um, I was just going to say like mm. that leads to like a really, a really easy change to make an in individual behavior, which yeah. is t to bring your own bags to the grocery store. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's sure. it's it's not that's not hard. That's actually a really really easy change to make, um, and and you can get like the the little bags that uh, fold up in on themselves so that they're really tiny. Yeah. Uh, and I I keep one of those in my in my purse or my shoulder bag. Uh, all the time. So if I stop at the grocery store on the way home from work, I have a bag. Now, uh, mm -hmm. where I live, there actually uh, is a plastic bag ban, but you could get paper bags. Um, but I don't even do that. We have a ton of recyclable bags. We bring them with us. We even got some mesh bags. So you know when you go to the grocery store and you buy vegetables or fruit, mm -hmm. like you have to then put them in plastic bags? Well, um, no, I just I just stop doing that all together. Like, at, to right, be fair, I yeah. don't buy that many carrots i just put like the four carrots and loose and then it, yeah it so i'm actually yeah, talking to somebody see, yeah. about this and they were like yeah they i don't think it was them themselves they said they were, they were having a conversation with their sibling or someone like that it doesn't matter who was like oh i didn't think you were allowed to i thought you had to put them in the individual <laughs> bags and i was like what who told you that that doesn't make any sense like it's just like it's a piece of fruit Wash it when you get home yeah. if you're concerned about um, that. Yeah. Like, it's not... Anyway, sorry to just do we bought, no, that's No, that's fine. Um, we, we bought yeah. some reusable mesh bags that you can yeah. use for, precisely for that purpose. You know, so if you're mm -hmm. buying, um, you know, like a bunch of potatoes or something and you're worried about them going everywhere in the cart or something like Brussels sprouts, which could fall through the holes in the cart, mm -hmm. you know, we have these mesh bags that we use um, yeah. for, th for that. And I just, we keep bags everywhere. We keep them in our bags. We keep them in our cars. Um, we grab them anytime we go to the store. It becomes a habit. Uh, that's right. And, and that's, that's and key, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, and bringing, like, mason jars for bulk foods, uh, and you just, you know, discount the weight. Um, but mm -hmm. it's it's an, it's an actually a pretty easy thing to do uh, that can make a real difference. You know, when cities have banned plastic bags or styrofoam or any of these other things, like, it really does make a difference, and it's you don't have mm -hmm. to wait for your city to ban it. You can just change your behavior. Exactly, um, and depending on what it is and what scale it's at, it can 
work upwards as well in terms of um, changing demand patterns. Um, I think relying on that is kind of a like a red herring in a way. Obviously, like it needs to be kind of both. But um, people, like you vote, it comes back to this concept of like you vote with your dollar, really. You vote for the world that Mm -hmm. you want to have with, um, yeah. That with yeah. what you decide or to spend the, your money on and, and the way you spend your money, so yeah, yeah. and that and that kind of goes to all of these sort of points. But um, and it, it's something else I wanted to just kind of add that kind of has been touched on throughout our conversation. Um, and it has to be said that where it's really hard to see an immediate personal benefit, um, it's a slower, more iterative journey. But with gentle harassment, it's doable to um. I say gentle gentle harassment from kind of my program design brain, but also, you know, in all the conversations that we have individually or with ourselves, you know, we need to remember to be kind to ourselves in this journey. It's not easy, like we're saying, um, but um, that's why our travel conversations are often dressed up as making trips more meaningful. Like I was saying, when we we do have these um, program-based conversations with the communities that we work with, it's about... What does this mean for you? And how can we make this positive like we were talking about as well? Um, so the next time that you forego your car keys to walk or ride a bike, you have permission, dear listener, to <laughs> feel really good about yourself, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and for you as well, Julia, and, and all of us live on Discord. Um, you know, I think while the large-scale policy and strategic action is really required, you know, you do have the power to influence just by leading by example. And I think that can be really underrated in a conversation like this. It's um, it's great that you're talking about Ogier, um, making a decision about four flights a year. That's actually, you know, I don't know how many conversations you're choosing to have about this, but it's inspirational to some people and it triggers that conversation. And um, like you were sort of saying, it activates it in your mind. There's lots of different yeah. ways of doing that. Um, One of the... personal example yeah. is powerful. Oh. Yeah. Just One of the ways that he does that actually yeah. is when we go out to restaurants, um, you know, he'll ask the people that work there, you know, are your eggs free range? You know, are mm-hmm. your dairy from grass fed cows? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And if the answer is no, then he eats vegan. And even if he knows Ooh, the answer is no, he still asks because he wants to communicate the message that people care about that, uh, that that's, and that it's honestly actually not a real increase in cost to have free range eggs, um, uh, you know, per person. So, and, and so he's been a really a big inspiration to me. I mean, honestly, the reason that I've become more vegetarian isn't because I suddenly felt like I had to do something more for the planet. It's because I live with a vegetarian, um, yeah. and somebody who's knowledgeable about these issues and very intentional about being vegetarian. Um, yeah. and, and that has made me reflect on my own behavior and made me want to, to change some of my own personal behavior. And I'm somebody who studies this issue, right? So like, I'm no role yeah. model when it comes to, <laughs> you know, having knowledge and changing behavior, but being around people who change, who've changed their behavior as a result really can be an inspiration. Yeah. Um, uh, to, to change your own. And, and so he's, I mean, I, I attribute a lot of the, um, change in my thought process on some of this and, and the change in some of my behaviors, uh, mm-hmm. to, to him and his, mm-hmm. his commitment to kind of living these principles. Um, yeah. the only time it really bothers me is when he makes me walk to the gym instead of driving <laughs> when it's really cold out, uh, cause he tolerates the cold a lot better than I do. Yeah. Yeah. There's, that can happen sometimes. I just can imagine, I can only imagine that when those challenging questions are being asked, it's that is incredibly polite. Yeah, <laughs> and it's and it's, never, it's, and it's, yeah. it's never about like the the servers, you know. No, no, so no. It's always just a, the messenger, yeah. right? It's about yeah, it's yeah. about the bigger picture, which is fantastic. I love that. I might start doing that myself. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because and it, and it just it all does is communicate the message that people in the community care about that. Um, yeah. Exactly, and uh, and then we try to patronize uh, restaurants that, that do, uh, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. think about you know the local supply of food and high quality food that's with humanely treated uh, animals. Um, yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah, I mean, so, I didn't have any other um, points okay. that I wanted to touch on too much. I feel like we've um, covered a lot of ground, and this has been a, like an amazing conversation. 
Um, that has probably gone a little bit longer than what we <laughs> had initially set out to do. <laughs> you know, but only love. two um, hours. I really hope I'm not holding you back from anything this morning. Um, did you want to do kind of a Q&A with the um, couple yeah, people we, in the Discord? Sure. We only have a few people with us. Um, yeah. But if you guys do have any uh, questions, some of you have been asking things throughout, and we've been trying to address those. Um, but if you do have any questions, we're happy to take them. Yeah, I can see the one about the... Um, I'll just read it because it's in front of me. A um, question around, is there any research on the behavioural effectiveness of taxes versus cap and trade systems from any field? And so it looks like you were able to respond. Um, the taxes are more effective than a cap and trade in, on individual behaviour. So, yeah, well, certainly, that's interesting. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't know that myself, yeah. so... Go ahead. Yeah, they're not... I mean, taxes are not popular. Um, but kind of as we talked about in the early part of the uh, the, the Stumpinar, yeah. um, they they tend to have more impact on individual behavior because of just the the increase in cost. So when you have uh, something that has a pretty elastic demand, this is a very economics turn, but elastic demand <laughs> essentially means that like you you could easily move to a different option, right? Uh, in, yeah. in your in your product yeah. choice, right? Uh, th then taxes make a big difference, right? Because it's like, well, uh, I was going to go get um, French wine for my dinner party tonight, but suddenly French wine had a huge tariff slapped on it, and now uh, this bottle of French wine, which used to cost uh, $20, now costs $50, or I can get this bottle of American wine or Australian wine, uh, which is still $20. Uh, my demand is pretty elastic, so I will go with this other kind of wine, um, yeah. as opposed to things that have inelastic demand, right? So if you are living somewhere where the only option to get to your work, uh, which is a 45-minute drive away, is to drive, right? Uh, taking a bus would take four hours, like it's just not an option. Then your demand to drive is pretty inelastic. Uh, in the case of a elastic demand, uh, a tax is going to change behavior. When that demand is inelastic, uh, it's very mm. difficult to change the behavior. So you're just paying higher cost. And that, as I said earlier, can have disproportionate effects on certain communities versus others. Um, and certainly the, the, the more well off yeah. you are, the more you can just absorb that cost, right? If yeah. you're a millionaire, Oh yeah. no, gas is a little more expensive. That's not a big yeah. deal. Yeah. Um, I just, so it's yeah. about, yeah. I guess I was interested in, in that answer just because, like, like I was mentioning, apparently, that when we did have a carbon tax in Australia, it was effective, but there's just no other comparison at that scale right. um, that we've had in place. So. Yeah. yeah, cap and cap and trade. I mean, there've been efforts on cap and trade. It's a hard system to get going. So cap and trade essentially means you cap the amount of carbon that can be emitted. And of uh -huh. course, carbon dioxide is only one of many greenhouse gases. Um, it's the most uh, the one that's most emitted, um, uh -huh. but it's the uh -huh. one that gets focused on, right? Uh, but uh, you put a cap on how much carbon can be emitted, and then uh, you give you essentially usually like issue permits. Uh, so you're allowed to emit this amount of carbon. I'm allowed to emit that amount of carbon. And then you set up a market where we can essentially like trade those um, those permits or credits uh, on, on an actual market. So then um, I, I want to emit more carbon than I'm allotted. So I'm going to trade to you, Bambi, my access. Uh, or sorry, I, I'm going to buy from you some right. of your credits right. so that I can um, I can emit yeah. more. That just that actually just sounds like what happened with Kyoto and Paris. <laughs> from, yeah. From my from my limited understanding of like, yeah, it's I think anything that's got an offset or credits in that in this sort of arena is kind of really ineffective because you can do accounting tricks and so on. But mm -hmm. I should preface that by saying I don't know the detail. This is just from from um from what I have read and have have had access to, but um so Super yeah. Skylake asks uh, who would voluntarily give up their allowance of carbon, um, yeah, and, and then Ogier responds because they could make money through selling them. So that's what it yeah, is. It's yeah, not yeah. like you're you're magnanimously giving it away. No, you're selling no, no. it, right? Yeah. You're you're changing your behavior in order to um, because you realize you can make money doing it the other way. And yeah. and one of the things about offsets, right, is like you know I mentioned that when I fly, I, I try to do offsets, but yeah. it's it's a way of making yourself feel better about the behavior you're engaging in. It's not actually changing your behavior. No, no. Um, I think I'll, so it's better than nothing, me, but... Yeah, offsets to me are just a bit of a, um... Ugh, I don't know the right sort of term for it now, but it's just, like, like almost like a batting. distraction. It's like, mm. if you, yeah, like, I'm feeling good, but, like, offsets into into what as well? It's like, planting more trees, that's great, but, like, we kind of need the trees we've got right now, but we're cutting those down. Or they're right. being it's burned. Sort of 
<laughs> right on, the, on a massive so, scale yeah. right so like if you're thinking about mm. like on a governmental scale what offsets and those sorts of things to do is it, it allows you to avoid making the really tough decisions that are exactly. going to lead to real change exactly and, exactly. and the problem is, is that we can't do that we can't mm -hmm. do that with climate change. You know, that's how we've been operating for decades. It's like, well, we'll cut this here and cut this there. We'll do what's easy. Um, but the stuff that's really hard is off, is really politically unpopular or goes against the interests of really powerful companies. And so the yeah. problem is, is like when you're aiming for a 5% reduction on average, uh, your behaviors are going to be very different than if you're engaging in an 80% reduction. I mean, think about it in terms of weight loss. If you're trying to lose five pounds... Uh, that's a very different approach than if you need to lose 105 pounds. Um, it's much more sustained. You need a, a much greater option. Like you can do a, slow, a smaller calorie reduction to reduce five pounds. And, and I'm, I'm, I realize I'm very much oversimplifying uh, weight loss and, and the many problems it takes with, with, uh, in order to lose weight. But I'm just trying to put it in a context that we understand that the kinds of changes you need to make um, in order to do an 80% average reduction are much, much more massive than a 5% reduction. Uh, yeah. And so what happens then is that then you do things like offsets and we're going to do this project, we're going to cut these corners right so your your aim is much smaller because you're trying to meet a five percent benchmark than if you're like 80 percent. okay 80 percent requires real change yeah. and real sacrifice yeah. Yeah. and um and that's hard so we're gonna just uh do what we can but what we can is not enough yeah 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 i think it's important and because it kind of again goes to this point around um actually having multiple things in place you know it's at a policy level high level just as much as it is in terms of individuals um it's, it's giving and giving people options it's like you, to reach the targets we need to reach we need to do more than one thing anyway right so while um any any of these sort of um economic based disincentives or changes are probably very important you can't really just do that by itself you know and I don't have the answers tonight, but, yeah. um, you know, it's, yeah, um, lots of different things, so like retraining, and because of the question in here around um, the, any studies around the cost in time and money of retaining work in the coal industry to work in renewable yeah. industries as well. Yeah. I don't have the answer to that question, but, like, it's actually probably quite complex. You do? Great. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> there was a study uh, in 2016, I'm sure there are others, but this is just the one that I'm aware of, um, that uh, it is actually pretty cheap, um, and that technical workers that currently work in coal will actually um, make more money in the solar industry, in the solar industry, um, but uh, managers and executives might make less. Um, and th this study, they say that the cost of retraining all of those workers um, would be, uh, I mean, somewhere between like two hundred million and uh, two billion, <laughs> right? So it's like a, you know, there's, it's kind wow. of hard to estimate exactly what the costs um, would be, uh, but, uh, you know, it's the money that would be made in the industry could be, um, you know, could offset that. But the problem is, is there's a lot of disincentives to do that. And you also have the issue of location, right? So uh, mm -hmm. where are the solar jobs? At least, and again, this is in the United States, but the solar jobs are out west, you know, um, oh, okay. They tend yeah, to. Okay. Oh, so, I mean, they're, they're you know most of them, the vast majority of them, uh, by uh, a magnet uh, several magnitudes is, is in California. Yeah. Um, yeah and then yeah. you know you also have a bunch in Arizona, Texas. There's some in the east of so Massachusetts, um, New York, New Jersey have solar jobs as well. Um, but that's not where the coal jobs are, which is generally in Appalachia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that so the problem of retraining, right? Could you retrain? Yeah, but then you have to have. The, I mean, moving from. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Pennsylvania to, um, uh, California is, is, is a big deal. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, scale large scale, well. you know, according to the study, mm -hmm. right. You know, this issue of, um, you know, and I'm looking at, I'm not looking at the study itself right now. Cause I was just looking it up to, to check, uh, cause I kind of remembered the study vaguely, but now I'm reading a, an article from Vox that's talking about this. I just want to make sure I'm crediting where I'm getting some of this information from. Good um, job. uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things they talk about the article is that, um, you know, j large scale job retraining programs have not been 
particularly effective. And there's certainly not a lot of incentive for uh, mm -hmm. the coal companies themselves to... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, provide that training, right? <laughs> like to provide, it's not like a coal yeah. company is gonna like suddenly become a solar company. Yeah. Uh, they don't really have a, a strong incentive to do that. Yeah, I, I think as well though, like it comes back to, um, I keep kind of calling it leadership in the area, but maybe that's not the best way to describe it. For instance, here in WA, we haven't had um, a local industry for um, building trains in about 20 years. We're actually bringing that back now, and it's yeah. a big sort of thing around um, local employment, and it's actually something that the current sitting government here in WA has sort of uh, reframed around um, increasing local jobs. Like, that's one of the big things, but they're like, we can do that and actually have this industry um, that will benefit the um, environment as well. They're not talking about it like that. They're talking about it in terms of local jobs in, um, like, engineering and, and whatever industries. The 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 goals mm -hmm. in the first couple of years are quite low, but the uh, my understanding is, is the intention is to scale it up. But also, when you talk about um, cost benefit, it really reminds me of this like uh, concept in public health, where it's like, well, what are the um, I think in economic terms it's um, externalities right of not taking action we get the massive cost associated with cleaning up after the bushfires and all of the um, right. I suppose intangible um, large costs that come in, in, in most cases in terms of this arena uh, long term which you've talked about a lot um but also short term as well in terms of, you know, people driving to work every day aren't getting enough physical activity. <laughs> right. It's, it's a public health style conversation as well. And I think that's lacking in um, yeah. the general conversation in, in terms of and cost and benefits. Right, and cost maybe that's where we want to look after these people. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, and that's where we should end on this, which is that climate change is not just an environmental problem, right? It, it, it touches yeah. on so many arenas in terms of uh, public health and security um, and animal rights and economic development um, and and fitness. And, like, there's so many ways. And, yeah. You know, community yeah. development um, and... Uh, and yeah, it's it's a thorny, thorny problem, and governments have, uh, in general, uh, with some exceptions, have not really been doing a great job. But that that doesn't mean that we as individuals can't um, do do our part and and act as role models um, and and create a bottom up sort of effort to yeah. to evoke change. Absolutely, this has been great. All right. Thank you. Oh, so it's been really fun. Yeah, you too. Uh, I thank you to our. Uh, our stalwarts in Discord who joined us early and stayed on with us for uh, two hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> um, oh my God, it's been that oh Jesus Christ. I know. Okay. Well, you know, it's, it's important. So um, it is important. Uh, I hope uh, you guys all enjoyed it. And so thank you. Um, and thanks, Bambi. This was really great. Yeah, Aww. thanks, Talia. Thanks, have guys. a great day. You too, or have a nice all evening. Right. <laughs> all right, bye, yeah. everybody. Thanks, I'm, I'm going to go to bed. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.